Yep. Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you very much. And hello, everyone. I, I'm Ezgi Özlisayla from Pharmaceutical Sciences Laboratory, and I'm a senior uh, PhD student uh, aiming to finalize my, my PhD soon. And it's my honor to present my PhD work today here in the Polymer Conference. And I would like to start with the regenerative medicine topic. So it's, it's basically the process of replacing engineering and regenerating human cells and tissues and organs to restore and establish the normal function. And then the, the, the whole application it can be divided, classified into the three different methodology that's used, can be the cell therapy itself by taking the biopsied cells or the donor cells and then upscaling it in vitro and then injection back into the body to repair the tissue. Or in some cases, then we can use the donor tissue or the fabricated scaffolds in, in the lab to able to implant and regenerate the defected tissue. And in some cases, then we need the biopsy cells and then also the scaffold uh, taken from the donor tissue or lab-grown scaffold and then maturing them in vitro and then implanting it back at the defect. So when regenerative medicine is having this many different applications that are still challenges uh, in terms of the cell survival proliferation. And then also the lab-grown scaffolds do not, uh, sometimes don't have enough recognition sites to able to induce the proliferation. And also other cases that uh, some cells need the specific alignment. And uh, in general, we have the challenges to uh, we have challenges for the cell differentiation that can randomly occur uh, or might not even occur depending on the microenvironment. And in general, we need uh, more proper molecular signals to guide the differentiation. So for stem cell therapies, tracking might be beneficial to able to tackle these challenges. For instance, by having the non-invasive imaging, uh, we can identify the stem cells in the adult organs and as well as unveil all these responses that uh, to able to understand the challenges better and how to how to improve them. And on the other hand, I mentioned about the controlling cell fate part. So in the human body, we have the stem cells and uh, in the in the normal conditions, what they do is that they are regulated by the extracellular matrix and it has like several different signals to able to do this uh, self renewal part and uh, some signaling pathways are shared between the cell uh, stem cells and also for the cancer cells and in general by controlling the cell fate of these cells we can use it for the tissue engineering purposes to direct the cell differentiation uh, as well as we can use the inhibition of the tumor growth uh, if we target the cancer stem cells and try to control the the cell fate on this one. And this can be applied uh, since these have the three common signaling pathways. So the audience is quite chemistry, back with the chemistry background. I'm sorry, I'm going a bit uh, biology, biology side, but I will try to make it as general as possible with a biology background here. Uh, but what I wanted to mention here that we can control the cell fate here, but uh, to able to do that, we need to have it uh, very specifically uh, to the directed, uh, exactly to the cell of our interest. And to able to do that, we can utilize the nanoparticles and the nanotechnology, and there are many different particles can do this job. But uh, particularly, I would like to talk about the mesoporosilica nanoparticles that I've used in my PhD thesis. And these particles are inorganic nanoparticles, and silica itself is biocompatible, classified by the FDA. And uh, these particles can be made by with the, these particles can be made with the different uh, shape and the size and then the pore size can be adjusted. And they are, they have, they are highly porous. So they have high surface area. And then because of the ceramic matrix, they are quite stable. And because of this porous structure, they can be used for both hydrophilic and the hydrophobic, hydrophobic cargo delivery. 
And uh, then the surface modification is tunable. We can functionalize the surface uh, according to our need, our needs, our applications. And this can be used to enhance the nanoparticle drug interaction if we are aiming drug delivery or for the tracking cells, for instance, and we would like to aim for the cell interactions. And this can be also achieved by uh, doing the surface functionalizations. And furthermore, we can also attach some uh, bio biologically active molecules on the surface and that could be used for cell targeting or endosomal escape as well. And beside, beside all these benefits of the mesophorous silicon nanoparticles, it has the hydrophilic nature due to the silanol group. So because of that, it's really suitable for the delivery of hydrophobic drugs in general, but also can be used for the hyd hydrophilic cargo delivery. So as I mentioned, there are several different uh, type of several different properties it has, and this can be adjusted by having uh, different uh, protocols, and then it would uh, it would give us the different size and morphology. The uh, silicon nanoparticles can be made in different shapes, different sizes, and the porosity and the pore size can be tuned. And then also the surface modification can be uh, can be altered, and all these would impact on the biological properties such as stability and the toxicity and biocompatibility of the nanoparticles as well as the internalization and the degradability. And in this thesis, we have utilized the surface modification properties and then uh, investigated the biocompatibility cellular internalization. And then also we went through different applications for cell tracking and dr drug delivery with these nanoparticles. So in general, uh, different modifications uh, are designed for different applications, but they can be uh, classified as these four different modifications. So the mesoporous silica was either synthesized by the, uh, synthesized as the, as, as it as standalone and it would give the OH groups from the silanol, or we have incorporated the uptest into the synthesis that would give us the amine rich surface modification. And now furthermore, we have used the uh, aziridin to able to achieve this MSMP highly cationic nanoparticles. Or uh, after, after uh, achieving these cationic nanoparticles, we have further derivatized the particles and for that, we use the acetylation, so acetic anhydrate, and then it uh, allow us to achieve neutrally charged nanoparticles. And then we also use the succinic anhydrate, and with that, we 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 got we receive these negatively charged nanoparticles. And then also we have utilized the PEG polymer, and then with that, we also investigated how the how the previously mentioned parameters impact in, in the biological uh, environment. And then we have achieved the poly, uh, highly polydispar uh, low polydispersity index nanoparticles with uh, approximately 150 nanometer size. And then the surface char charge was depending on the modification on the surface. And then we have also used the uh, thermogravimetric analysis to able to confirm the organic content on the nanoparticles with the taking advantage advantage that the silica itself is inorganic. And in the first study, we have functionalized the mesoporous silica nanoparticles with the PEPEG copolymers. So these are the polymers commonly used uh, to improve the transfection of the oligonucleotides. And then uh, we have attached these uh, copolymers on the mesoporous silica uh, nanoparticle surface. And then also, we also investigated the uh, human serum albumin coating uh, as these proteins are used for transport. Uh, these are the transport protein in the in the bloodstream. And then they 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 are responsible to transport the drugs, some some of the drugs uh, to the cells. So we wanted to investigate these, how these particles uh, would get benefit by these modifications. And then also we checked here the storage conditions, if these nanoparticles can be stored as a, as a suspension or can they be uh, 
stored as powder. And then what we have seen that with um, when we have the protein coating on it, that it improved the storage conditions and then also the redispersibility. But overall, we could uh, conclude from this study that uh, 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 liquid storing was better than the powder storing of these nanoparticles. And then uh, by having these modifications, it was aligning with the literature and then we could improve the particle internalization as you see here. When we have no modification, the cellular internalization is quite low and then it, it increased higher. And then here, I could mention that the suspension uh, stored nanoparticles were internalized better than the powder counterparts. And besides that, we checked if the protein coating on it uh, can improve the colloidal stability. And we observed that for the PPEG uh, copolymer, uh, it was indeed possible that we achieved higher uh, colloidal stability after powder uh, storing these particles. But uh, for the PEI modified nanoparticles, uh, actually it worked the uh, opposite and then it caused some aggregation. So then we could conclude from that uh, the protein coating is uh, highly surface modification dependent. But overall, what we could see, we also checked here the stem cell differentiation, if it would, Im uh, if it would impact the differentiation path. And what, what we could see that there was no side effects of, on the skeletal muscle differentiation by using these nanoparticles. So then furthermore, we wanted to check uh, the nanotoxicity profiles of these surface modified nanoparticles. And for that, we used the amine, uh, amine modified nanoparticles and then the highly positively charged PE nanoparticles. Then we had the PEG again here. And then also the succinylated nanoparticles were investigated. And then uh, our results showed here that the cationic PEI particles had the highest cytotoxicity. And then they also showed the higher cardiovascular toxicity. And when we checked the penetrance of these nanoparticles in the zebrafish embryo, uh, we could see that the highest pen penetrance was also in these PEI nanoparticles. So the high tissue penetrance showed more cytotoxicity and impaired cardiovascular function. And this, this was correlated with the results with the cell culture, actually. Uh, and what we can say from this, that the efficient penetration can be utilized to decrease the therapeutic dose. And zebrafish model uh, can be utilized to evaluate the design carrier systems. So this was a really nice model to evaluate the nanotoxicity profile. And then after evaluating the nanotoxicity profile, we have further evaluated the applicability of these metaporosilica nanoparticles. And uh, in this study, we, we evaluated if we can use them for the long-term tracking and monitoring probes. Um, we use this hydropho hydrophobic carbocyanin dye for this purpose. And these, this is the commercially available membrane dye. And what it does that normally uh, it's purchased to able to track the cells, but in, in the applications after two, three days, the signal is disappearing. So we wanted to check if we can improve this commercially available systems by using our nanoparticles. And then uh, we have incorporated the dye as a five weight percent in the highly efficient penetrance, uh, what we have seen in the previous previous research, and we, we have used this MSMP nanoparticles for this purpose, the highly cationic nanoparticles. And then uh, it could, then when we had the, yeah, then here we use the two different models, animal models, we have used the mice model, and then also the choreal, uh, this chicken embryo model, which has the choreal lantoic membrane. And then what it, uh, we, we could, implants the, we, we could xenograft the tumors here. And then after a follow-up time, we could then track the, the cancer cell invasion and the circulation in the bloodstream. So when we have the, when we have labeled these tumors uh, with the nanoparticles and then implant on the, on the model embryo, then we could follow the tumor for five days. And then also, 
just a second i will try to okay my video is not working i'm sorry is it working well, that's supposed to be a video, but I'm sorry, I couldn't make it work that we could see the cancer cell invasion here on the on the day five already. And then when we when we have done the mesoporous silicon on a part, when we have done the same uh, experiment on the mice, we could track the tumors for 32 days, so up to a month. And besides the carbocyanin dye that we have used here, we can use uh, several different types of these dyes depending on the detection uh, detection method. And this uh, feasibility to freely choose the dye cargo uh, gives us the freedom to able to use these monitoring probes for, uh, for different applications. So it, it, it shows that the nanoparticles can actually improve the already commercially available systems. And then furthermore, we wanted to investigate the if these can be these nanoparticles can be used for the targeting, uh, targeting moiety, if we can attach some targeting on, on the particles and then see that can we uh, achieve the drug delivery onto the cells. Uh, so as I mentioned, the some of the signaling pathways uh, work both on the cancer stem cells and the, and, and the normal stem cells or the healthy stem cell, let's say. And in, in this uh, particular project, we wanted to target the breast cancer, uh, cancer stem cells. And then we first investigated if the, the activation of this notch signaling can enhance the tumor growth. And then when we have, uh, when we have achieved that, yes, it can, it actually, uh, is notch dependent, this notch signaling dependent, then we have also found that uh, when the notch signaling is hyperactive, that also shows enhanced glucose uptake. So then we can use this glucose uptake as a targeting moiety. So what we have done that we have used the mesoporous silicon nanoparticles, and then we have uh, attached the glucose on, on top of the silicon nanoparticles, and then we have investigated if uh, they would be having a higher internalization rate. And as we have hypothesis, hypothesis this, then both in vitro and the in vivo, we could achieve the higher internalization compared with the non-glucose uh, tag nanoparticles. And then uh, we have loaded the gamma secretase inhibitor, the DOPT drug, it's a small uh, it's a small molecule hydrophobic drug and has therapeutic potential but uh, it failed in the clinical trials uh, because it showed some uh, gastroenterological side effects. So it should be controlled in deli uh, con it should be delivered in the control manner. So for for this paper, uh, we have loaded this the, uh, DAPT onto the glucose decorated mesoporous silicon nanoparticles and then uh, we have used the CAM model as we have used previously. And then we could see the fold reduction here that when we had the glucose decoration, we could increase and shrink the cancer stem cells. And then also we could really uh, show that we could we could show the tumor size decreasing on this on these xenografts. And then furthermore, we wanted to investigate how we can take this surface modification of the mesoporous silica and to able to overcome the biological barriers. So for this project, we have uh, used the um, co-culture models to uh, able to recapitulate the tumor environment a bit more closer to the real, real time, real life. So we have the tumor cells here and then also the cancer associated fibroblasts. So we have, when we have done this co-culture and then we have treated the nanoparticles on the co-culture, we could see the difference uh, on the preference that some surface modified nanoparticles are prefer preferentially internalized in the cancer cells and they were not internalized much on the fibroblasts. But this was on, uh, only on the 2D. So we wanted to take it to 3D co-cultures and then we have used the collagen as a hydrogel matrix here. 
and then we could uh, show that the negatively and neutrally charged nanoparticles can penetrate through the extracellular matrix and internalized in the tumor tumor tissues, these like mini mini tissues, and they were not internalized by the fibroblast as much as the tumor cells. Uh, even though the previous results show that positively charged, highly cationic nanoparticles uh, perform better for different applications, uh, when we when we investigated to overcome these biological barriers, we have observed that the positively charged particles uh, are actually stuck on the on top of the on top of the collagen matrix, and then they they are not internalized by the cells. So we wanted to take the advantage of these uh, neutrally charged nanoparticles, and then we wanted to use our uh, favorite drug, DAPT, again to inhibit the cancer growth and investigate that can we actually have the this inherit targeting without ha having the glucose mo uh, glucose decoration on top. And we could see that uh, clearly we could have, uh, when we compared it with the free free uh, drug, we could have the decrease in the these organoids and we could have, have uh, we observed the shrinkage in the organoids. So we have enhanced the therapeutic effect of that. Uh, on the tumor in organotypic 3D co-culture environments. And then finally, we wanted to investigate, uh, can we derive stem cell differentiation in 3D matrix with these nanoparticles? So the aim was to have these nanoparticles that we know that it works. And we have already established that these nanoparticles can be, uh, can be used to deliver the DAPT drug in vivo, we have already observed. So we wanted to make this nanocomposite matrix that has the stem cells in them. And then uh, over time, then they would, uh, the nanoparticles can be internalized by the cells. And then what happens inside that uh, when the particles are internalized, it would release the drug and then it, it would then inhibit the not signaling. And therefore the cells can differentiate from stem cells to skeletal muscle cells, for instance. So to able to do that, we first investigated, can we actually have a nanocomposite uh, hydrogel systems and how is our toxicity profile looking like? And we have uh, we have observed that the part, uh, surface modification clearly impacts the cytotoxicity profile. And we could say that up to 100 microgram per milliliter, we could get uh, uh, biocompatibility. And then furthermore, we wanted to uh, we label the nanoparticles with the treats label, and then we investigated how these nanoparticles are uh, dispersed in the in the hydrogel when we when we are making them. So it was that particles and uh, uh, non crosslinked collagen is combined with the cells, and then after that it it crosslinks together to able to form the hydrogel. And then we could see that the negatively charged and the neutrally charged nanoparticles uh, were uh, showing better homogeneity, whereas positively charged particles uh, aggregated. And then when we checked the PEG, PEG particles, they, they had this intercolloidal stability. So they, they uh, form large chunks inside the hydrogels. And then we have investigated if these particles can be internalized by the cells. And then for that, we have uh, lab we have stained these micro tissues and then also checked under the flow cytometry and detected, we have degraded the gels and then collected the cells and then run through the flow cytometry to able to investigate particle internalization. And we have observed that neutrally charged and negatively charged nanoparticles demonstrated the higher cellular internalization. And then finally, we have used the DAPT to able to investigate the differentiation. And for that, we have utilized the negatively charged nanoparticles, as we have seen that they are the high highest internalized particles. And then we could clearly see that when we uh, use the myoblast, and over time, they, we have, when we check the genetic, uh, gene, gene markers uh, that indicates the differentiation, uh, we could see that when we treat them with the 
DIPT, we could clearly see the my, myogen, myogenic differentiation markers are uh, in, increasing. And then also the confocal microscopy showed that we could achieve denser and more aligned myotube formation, uh, which, which shows the maturity of the skeletal muscle tissues. So in conclusion, uh, with the surface modification and H, uh, HSA coating, uh, we could improve the biocompatibility. And overall, the surface modification uh, of MSN ensures the safe and effective therapeutic delivery and the choices depending on the application. And in general, mesoporosilica nanoparticles enable the long-term optical tracking of cell populations in vivo. Uh, additionally, functionalized nanoparticles can specifically target and inhibit the cancer stem cells. And besides that, they can be also utilized to make these nanocomposite matrices to able to regulate the microenvironment. So with that, I would like to thank my supervisors, Jessica Rosenholm and Cecilia Sakran for their great support for my PhD studies, and also all the group members and our collaborators and everyone uh, contributed to get these uh, publications. And also to our uh, to audience, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. Okay, thank you.